Thank you, Michelle. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, let's get going. And everyone can folks see that screen? Good. Thank you. I am grateful to be with you folks today. I'm especially grateful to be, um, to be on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. In the spirit of practicing a more connected way of being, from my back window here, I can see the North Shore Mountains. I'm a few blocks away from where my parents met and grew up. Both my family um, are settlers coming from one side from Iceland, the other from Scotland, coming from home, coming to Canada to find home in the late 1800s. And today, this morning, I'm zooming from my laundry room, which is also my office, um, where I share home with my husband and two kids and three housemates. I'll start with a story. 20 years ago at a local neighborhood meeting, a mental health advocacy group asked local churches what they were doing for um, the increasing number of homeless people in the neighborhood. And at that time, this blue church with the red door wasn't doing very much. After, a meet, after that meeting, a few members of the church formed Salisbury Community Society, and they began to operate three community houses in the neighborhood. The idea was to bring a diverse group of people together and figure out how to share life. And in those early days, a lot of lessons were learned, like sharing kitchens and bathrooms with your own family is, is tough, but doing it with strangers or people that were coming on temporary stays was even more difficult. Gentrification moved into the neighborhood and as it had been for many years, and more and more people were needing housing. And Salisbury was really compelled to think more than just a few houses. And as we began to look to purchase a, a, an apartment building, um, we really kind of envisioned the benefit of having affordable integrated housing that was situated within a supportive community. People from different backgrounds in the same building kind of live and grow, grow together. To use Patty's term earlier this morning, we were dreaming of kind of a mixed tenure with supportive services kind of model. And we got a lot of feedback at the time from those who wanted to live in that building. And they wanted to have lots of light and they wanted to have their own unit, their own kitchen and bathroom, a lock on their door, and plenty of shared space too. But as land prices skyrocketed and the dream of finding an already established apartment building began to fade, the group began looking at the church's parking lot and community garden. Soon the Cohere Foundation was formed. The church gifted the land to the Cohere Foundation. And over the next few years, folks from Salisbury Community Society, the church and Cohere Foundation um, gave in lots of input on many aspects of the building, including the design and ideas around community formation. So I'll be reflecting on that community, um, Cohere. Um, it's a 26 unit apartment building that's situated on Grandview's parking lot. Um, it's home to 38 people and where Salisbury Community Society has their office. The photos I've used today are all pre-COVID, so rest assured we are following safety protocols. I've organized my presentation to really try and address some of the social design aspects of the building. And then I'll discuss, discuss our social sustainability framework and some of the challenges and learnings. I'm gonna try and provide some concrete examples of how we've tried to operationalize community, the how, the, um, the policy and the practice. And I guess I just wanna to say too, we have some ideas on what's working or what has worked or what could work, but really love the name of this um, these workshops as being learning journeys because there certainly are a lot of learning and lessons and mistakes made along the way. In terms of the social design aspect of Cohere in a typical rental, we're told that kind of 15 to 20 percent of the building is typically used in common uh, for common areas and in Cohere we have 47 percent. Um, on three residential floors, that's the yellow portion of the building, um, we have pods or social clusters um, on either side of the hallways um, by the balconies. And on one side of the hallway, there's laundry and um, a seating area. And on the other, these um, are kind of areas that are extensions of folks' living rooms. So they reflect the uniqueness of the neighbors who live there. There's one that has more toys. There's one that's a cozy reading nook. And there's one that's set up as kind of a games table. Um, when folks enter in the front door, they pass through the living room, the dining hall, we have a reflection room, there's a kitchen, we have a guest room, a small library, a reading room, and a meeting space. 
And when we talk about where people gather, um, we certainly, people gather in the gardens by the mailboxes, that's where that workstation was. Um, there's a projector in the living room where folks can stream yoga classes um, or movies or sporting events. Um, in the reflection room, which is the right on, on your right um, there, um, we have a tenant that has piano lessons in that room. Um, folks gather for meditation, for prayer. People study and knit in that space or just read. And these are common areas or extensions of tenants' homes. It's been really important that we've created systems um, to empower people to use those spaces. So Google Calendar is one way that tenants can book spaces and host groups. The guest suite is really well used and mostly managed by tenants themselves where they can invite a family or friend to stay by donation. A stroke recovery group meets regularly on the main floor, um, a girl guide group. And this year we hope to welcome an AA group as well as a single mom support group. All of these um, groups are hosted by a tenant or two. And if it's during office hours, Salisbury will take on some of the hosting duties. People also, just to mention, people gather in people's homes as well. Um, we have regular floor dinners where neighbors gather or bring food together and eat in, everyone, in each other's units. But to be clear, building community space doesn't necessarily mean that community will follow. This isn't kind of a Kevin Costner fields of dream thing. You know, having shared space is certainly the first step in creating community opportunities, but figuring out who gets to make decisions about those spaces, um, who cleans up afterwards, who rents the room, who does the hosting, you know, that's when people start kind of glazing over, walking, <laughs> backing up and just kind of referring to management. Um, Co-creating community is really slow and it's iterative work. It takes intentional acts of nurturing neighborliness and um, amongst a particular group of people, right, in a, in a particular home. When we envision the community life at Cohere, it really looks like friendships growing, less about hiring people whose job it is just to care about community and more about nurturing an environment where neighbors are really encouraged to support neighbors. Having a social sustainability framework has impacted many aspects of our work. It includes the invitation, so the, the housing application, how we invite people into the housing, how we manage those common spaces and how we share those common spaces, as well as how we coach and equip tenants. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the community builders group. Um, that's been really key and how can we train um, a kind of a and and have an environment where we are nurturing um, relationship building it's really important and this framework impacts the way also that our board and governance holds power makes decisions and practices kind of nurturing relationships as part of their work as well i want to spend the rest of my time talking about nurturing relationships that last piece and one of the learnings that um, we've had is around this question of who's sociability Unlike other organizations, staff at Cohere, we try and take a be quite intentional about staying out of the center of community to make room for connect, neighbors to connect. So we've been focusing on how we can support neighborliness through our community builders group. And this group consists of two tenants from each residential floor and a staff person. They meet regularly to make decisions about um, the will that impact the community with an emphasis on training and equipping community members with the tools to be good neighbors. The community builders group at Cohere plays a really important role in providing the relational foundation for setting community norms and responding to conflicts. The CBG um, was, that's the community builders group, was established in the first year of Cohere's operating. And going forward, if and when we operate additional sites, which we hope we do, it's our intent to spark CBGs in all of them. You know, when COVID hit, this group really went into overdrive with meal trains, prescription pickups, grocery runs, checking in on neighbors, safety protocols, and even like creating some really great signage for folks. As staff don't live in the building, um, it's been really important that we see our, ourselves as helping set a table, doing some backroom prep, but this and, su and support with some resources, but the actual feasting, the actual neighboring, the primary relationship is between neighbors. And how this gets played out is having a really clear terms of reference for the CBG. That's the how do we work together document. It's about our consensus decision making um, frameworks as well as staff 
understanding what their job is and what they're not. And we talk a lot about boundaries and about and revising our job descriptions regularly. Another learning has been when housing people who have had substandard housing for a long time or experienced generational trauma, you know, this bar of what safety means is really hard to nail down. We have fire safety plans and first aid kits, but do staff and neighbors know how to listen to someone who feels psychologically unsafe? We kind of we like this idea of co-creating brave housing versus safe housing at co-house at cohere. Brave housing really does look like having those safety plans and also staying in awkward conversations um, with people about how your actions maybe have impacted them. Operating housing where people can feel safe to be known is a really long game strategy. And um, if people don't feel comfortable being who they are in our housing, they likely won't stay. So in terms of the operations, how this gets played out, it's having those, um, those safety plans and those policies on protecting and tenants, but also um, having training on how to have hard conversations. We've had workshops on toxic masculinity, conflict resolution framework, and having and hiring um, staff that have skills in these areas. Because living in a more connected community can get really messy. You know, hands get dirty, feelings inevitably get hurt. As operators, I think we have a really particular role to play in supporting our tenants flourishing through brave housing that deepens connections between neighbors, as well as centering the voices of those who live there. Knowing that nurturing neighborliness and building connections takes time and intentionality, as well as policies and practices that reflect shared values and norms. We often say like we can't scale relationships. What works in one relationship won't necessarily work in all relationships. They really do need to be made one at a time. But housing operators with tenants can establish norms. So those norms are rituals, their practices, their routines. Um, they really do lay a foundation on how relationships can deepen. I think I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for um, letting me share with you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, that was uh, an incredible presentation. I wrote down uh, all sorts of quotes that were, I thought were quite, quite profound. Um, let's launch right into some people's questions because I know we're a little behind on the agenda and I, I'm, I don't know if we'll get the full time we had in the last session for questions. So uh, from Moira, is it a requirement to participate in the community group? What happens if someone doesn't want to join? Great question. Um, when we screen people to do interviews for housing spots, so when we invite people into the neighbor um, into the community, we ask what kinds of things they like to do and how they want to be involved. It's not mandatory, but the community builders group, um, we try and have it be a reflection of the community. So it's quite a diverse group, people from different income levels, and we kind of ha in, have been over the years kind of, you know, uh, noticing when we can um, draw in someone's expertise in that group. But there's lots of ways to participate in the, in the community. Um, the community builders group is just one committee. We love committees that go here. We have many committees. You're, you're, it's really kind of a co-housing model, really, where people buy into this notion from, from the get-go, and then there are consensus building mechanisms. Um, Gazelle, I see your hand up, but I'm gonna quickly take one more question in the chat. Um, from Leanne, did I miss it or did you mention if there are criteria that folks need to need to meet to live in the building? So I'm yeah. assuming this is this is maybe about income, but possibly other things too, like that desire yeah. to be in community. Great question. No, I didn't. You didn't miss <clears throat> anything. I didn't talk about that. We ask for people to have either a physical or relational relationship to the Grandview Woodlands neighborhood. Um, so it's really important that they have already some established networks of care um, in the in the neighborhood. That's been really important to us. Um, we have a certain income mix. And so um, we have people on income assistance and people who are high earners in the building. Um, and so it's if we have a unit that's available, we try and um, replace them, you know, fill that unit with a person that's on a similar income level um, other than being able to like make your own decisions around your health care and your own personal um, decision making ability like that's um, we're not a supported housing environment we don't have 24-hour staff with professional services so those are kind of the main things in terms of what people this the um, criteria right and maybe to be clear for people who are um, uh, less familiar with your model your mix of incomes isn't about um, 
isn't about the performa that you had and cross subsidization. It's actually an intentional community that you want to have people from, in some cases, quite quite significantly different incomes. Agreed. In your building, yeah. is that is that that's correct? That's a that's a great yeah, yeah. way of describing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gazelle, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Janet. It was a great presentation. My, my question is more about how do you keep this model uh, financially viable because keeping maintaining and also developing the shared spaces <coughs> requires capacity. And I'm wondering how do you keep that balance so that it fits to the affordability of this model? Yeah. So, um, I'd be naive to say that like, you know, I just want to say we're only five, four years of operating. So, um, and we've done, we've, we've been able to um, balance our budgets every year. Um, the big part of that is what Michelle discussed um, is this, is this mixed um, income piece. And so we have higher earners in our building that pay more um, that offset those rents that are lower or below market and um, low end market. And um, so, our baseline kind of um, operating budget um, covers all of our operating costs. Um, we do do some um, small fundraising, um, but the hope is that the project will be fully sustainable and we're on kind of track to do that, or at least close to. And is the fact that you had land donated um, by the church, is that a, I'm, I'm assuming that's a fundamental reason you were able to get to like 47% of your space being common areas, because that is so high above the norm. Yeah, it is. And, um, yeah. you know, we talk about challenges and learnings, you know, I think we probably could manage to have a little less. <laughs> Maybe right. 40, right? Because yeah. it's a lot of space to share with a small group of people. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, great. I just also want to highlight that um, Rebecca Pousset is here and she is, works at the Cohere Foundation. And so she has some of the, I don't know if um, Rebecca is anything that we, that I've shared just around the financial piece that you want to clarify, or do you think that's clear for folks? Um, just to say, we actually don't have a mortgage. Um, so one of the, um, the church uh, it, as part of donating the land um, they were very committed to us um, not fundraising all the money in advance of the project. Um, and so we don't actually have to pay off the mortgage, which is massive. Um, yeah, that's all I'll add right now. An important piece. Yeah, an important piece. So uh, but that, that does lead me to kind of ask how, how replicable your model is, because these are a lot of special conditions. Although there are projects out there that that are being built on land already owned by nonprofits or churches or uh, or land being donated by you know municipalities. So do you do you see your model as as being replicable both this this quantity of common space and and the intensity of programming? I probably wouldn't be excited to share as much as I am if I didn't think that it was replicable. I think there's some really good learnings and some really good ways of thinking about how we um, support people in their housing. And so I think, um, you know, could we design an exactly like a replica of Cohere 2? Like point to, no, do we want to? Probably not. Like, <laughs> let's do something else. But there's elements here that are so, so, so good. And I think um, we're just constantly learning and, and changing and adjusting. And um, But I do think there's this, and that's part of the work that Cohere Foundation continues to do is to engage in the community around faith um, communities and other nonprofits that have land and want right. to use it in unique ways. That do have a, a similar opportunity to what you, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Leanne. Do you think there is a limit on the number of floors or units that an intentional community like this could have? Like, would too much density not work as well? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a sweet <laughs> spot. I think we, um, um, yeah. I haven't done like a huge amount of thinking on what exact ratio we'd want, but I think you wouldn't like let, you know, 50 to 75 people with our staffing levels, we could probably handle so one or two more floors, but we were, we were really constrained by lots of constraints that we couldn't go higher. Right. Um, but yeah, I think you could do, um, I, I think you can get to a critical place where you just, you can't have just one tenant support worker supporting 200 yeah. people, right? Like you really need to yeah. have some infrastructure built in there. And so, um, 
yeah, I think we could have another floor. I'd love to be able to have three bedrooms, for instance, to offer families. We only have two bedrooms and one bedrooms mm -hmm. in studios. Right. Okay, that's interesting. And you also have community builders per floor, right? So I guess that would be another factor if you go to a, a, a larger building is just kind of keeping that, yeah. that kind of granular champion model. And again, I think that has a lot to do with how we invite market um, and communicate about our housing, what people can expect when they right. apply to our building. Okay, great. Um, question from Maura, what does your feedback loop look like? How do you know what's working well? Such a good question. Yeah, we've had a developing evaluation framework that um, we're hoping to roll out a new one um, this year. But in the past, we've done these things called reflection conversations. So I sit down with staff and with tenants. So one staff and a couple of tenants, and we just have a really close listening time of like what their experience is, um, we also do 360 feedback for all of our performance reviews and we invite tenants to give us feedback on how we've communicated with them. Um, this has been really key in terms of our learning, especially around some of the power dynamics amongst um, tenants and staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Maura, I think in your presentation, for those who are listening to it, you, you kind of brought up the notion of vulnerability, right? And I think that is that can be scary for our landlords and property managers, kind of opening that that Pandora's box. Um, but I think, um, you know, of, of our project partners who who are doing this kind of work, there are more more benefits than drawbacks on the whole, if you're willing to kind of go into that that terrain. And there's a lot to learn if you do. Um, any other questions or hands up? I mean, I can come up with all sorts of questions, but I, I know we've got just, lots of smart people here. Okay, Jeanette. On, I'm just going to riff on that idea because I think it's a great one. I loved what Maura said about vulnerability, and I think it is scary. But you know what also is scary is living in a building where no one trusts each other, and there's acrimony between building managers <laughs> and tenants yeah. and a real power differential. And quite frankly, it's I think it's just more about people not necessarily having skills or hiring um, vision holders if you will around some of the the soft and not, i don't even want to call it soft skill but it's like how do we relate well how do we talk about our wobbly bits in front of each other and just get into it a bit and have those conversations i think that will actually change some dynamics that need to really be um in, you know interrogated and i think walking in buildings where there isn't any trust that's that's scary walking in a building that has vulnerable leadership you That's talked about cool. you talked about um, how the community builders group really ramped up during COVID. Do you do you also find that from kind of a practical standpoint, um, having people uh, neighbors knowing each other, supporting each other, kind of active in conversation with you, that it that it relieves you sometimes of um, of, of work during a crisis. Yeah, I think we have less calls to emergency services. I think we have less. Um, blow ups, I think we can understand when people, we have a number of people that are um, newly in their recovery or having, dealing with active mental health stuff. So having neighbors, that's not just staff, it's like neighbors that can accompany people through things. It's not everyone, but it's one or two people that they can rely on. Um, I think it's, it's been really important for us. Mm -hmm. Um, we've heard from, uh, in some conversations, uh, about, uh, building managers finding, and this is particularly in a seniors context, finding they get, um, they get calls to come in and, and help with something in the suite. Um, and what they realize very quickly is there's nothing really that that person needs help with. They, they just needed to talk to somebody that there's some yeah. loneliness there. And so, you know, it's I a, think, I think a, a part of how we hire is that mm -hmm. if people know each other, there's, that's, that's not. An, an everyday ask of building managers when they've got so many other things so if you can if you can cultivate that intentionally yeah, it's, over and time it's how we it's how we hire our building our current building manager and our admin manager and you know the people that have these this kind of this openness and willingness to sit down with people and get to know them and we try whenever um, rachel goes and does a repair if someone's hanging out in the lobby it's really been like you want to come and help me with this down in the parkade mm -hmm. or do you want to help you know can you can we i need to go make a run to the hardware store like you want to come with um so trying to partner as much as we can in our in our community doing that work with folks that don't have full-time jobs has been really important to us okay great 
I really liked your your uh, your your slide, the field of dreams slide, right? Because uh, we do talk about that. Those those spaces are really important, and if you don't have them, it's 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 hard to build yeah. community. Um, but it doesn't having those spaces doesn't just mean it it magically happens. Some organic connections will will happen, and some champions will emerge unsupported, and you know. Um, but uh, but the the magic really happens when you do both you know, create okay. good spaces and actually, you know, program them, um, not just for tenants, but with tenants. Yeah. 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 C we have really one minute. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say we have one minute before we go back into the main session. So uh, good time to for, for people to comment on what they're hearing or ask a quick last question. And if not, Jeanette, just feel Thanks, free everyone. to riff on whatever well, whatever you're thinking it's all good thanks for oh, man, that was okay. just a really beautiful storytelling and setting i wanted to uh, say yeah really hey thanks Megan. Megan. yeah i'm just going to read this out uh rebecca says to respond to the question about replicability especially in regards to financially in addition to funding from bc housing and cmhc we had significant financial support from organizations that don't normally fund housing but we're really excited to fund our sociability slash community vision so th thanks for that that detail rebecca i think that that matters right because this this issue of funding the programming is really thorny with everybody that we talk to and so having those non-housing funders that understand the value of that and what it can deliver to a community over time